Thank you everyone for coming today. I know that um, all of our schedules can be very busy and whether you're joining us early in the morning or in the middle of your day um, or in the late evening, we definitely appreciate those of you who are joining us live. And we hope that you are bringing some questions to the table. We really would like for this to be an interactive webinar, um, but please don't feel like you need to take notes. This will be uploaded to YouTube um, later on this evening. So you can just sit back and relax and enjoy and um, bring your questions to Dr. Riaz. And um, if you need to leave early or come and go, then that will be uploaded to YouTube for you to view later. And today's webinar is the second webinar of the Advocacy Series of 2021. And this is actually the third and final event on this quarter's topic, which is Advocacy at All Ages, which is um, in this topic, we've been exploring how to establish a foundation of advocacy skills for children, teens, and young adults, just to help get them on a more successful path for managing living with FOP. Um, in April, we did a podcast with Amanda Kelly, and in May, we did a community panel. Um, so I definitely encourage you to go back and look at those resources. And after today's resource webinar, um, you'll be receiving a survey via email and make sure you fill out that, that survey, not only to give us feedback about this quarter, but we will also have um, the ability for you to request the resource workbook that Hope and myself are putting together that accompanies all of the events that we've had for each of the quarters. Uh, my name is Karen Kirkhoff and I'm the Family Services Coordinator here at the International FOP Association. And I'd like to get started with just a few Zoom housekeeping tips. Um, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you will see a menu bar. There is a um, chat button and we welcome you to put your experiences or any comments that you may have in the chat section. And then there's also a Q&A button at the bottom. If you put your cursor down at the bottom, if you don't see that toolbar, it should pop up. But the Q&A button is where you can type in questions. If you have questions for Samira, um, please feel free to type them in. But we also do have the capability if you would like to ask your question live and be a little bit more interactive, um, then there is a button at the bottom that says raise your hand. And so if you click on that and raise your hand, um, then I can call on you and we can turn on your video and turn on uh, your, your audio. Right now, everyone's video is off and everyone is muted just to keep things a little bit more quiet for the presentation. Um, but Samira has laid out her webinar today in uh, three sections based on age categories. Um, each section will have a case study. So after each case study, we'll take one or two questions specific to that age category. Um, but for sake of time, we'll probably only take a few questions, but at the end, um, if we need to go back and ask questions for any of the case studies um, previously, there should be time to do that. So again, type in your Q&As or feel free to raise your hand and be a little bit more interactive. Um, so I'm now excited to introduce finally our, present, our presenter for today, um, Dr. Samira Riaz. She is a registered health psychologist and cognitive behavior therapist with over 18 years of experience working within the UK National Health Service, the charity section and various healthcare agencies, including her current position, which is with Open Health, and she's been there since 2017. Samira is also part of the chronic pain team at the Royal National Orthopedic Hospital, working with patients diagnosed with pain and other mental health conditions such as depression and anxiety. And she's also a trained cognitive behavioral therapist, logging over 500 clinical hours, and is very in tune with the difficulties faced by people experiencing mental health and the complicated pathways when, ex when accessing help and, help and support. Um, she also has done some collaborative work with the pharmaceutical companies, which has given her the opportunity to actually interact with a few FOP families. So we're very excited to welcome her today and have her as part of this series. So Samira, thank you so much for being here. Welcome. And let me stop sharing my screen so that I can turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Karen. That's a lovely introduction. And um, uh, hello, everyone. And thank you so much for joining today. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. I have a few slides um, to go through whilst presenting just to give um, a good overview of some of the case studies and some of those experiences. And so um, I'm really excited to go through these because I think that they're very relevant to um, questions that came back 
um, from yourselves when we wanted to really tailor um, the types of information that we wanted to share today, because we could go on um, and have a whole day of this. There's quite a lot to cover. Um, so I've been quite selective in streamlining it. So just to start off, um, these are some of the questions that came back. They're not all of the questions, but some of the main ones um, in terms of where what we wanted to explore during this presentation. So, um, you know, how do you cope um, with with children's emotions and and support them to express their uh, fears and anxiety and when it particularly when it builds up? You know, how do how do you help your child live with a constant unknown um, since FLP can strike at any time? Um, when and what age is it appropriate to give kids more freedom to take over some responsibilities or you know, the activities that they would like to do to prevent flare ups? How do you get past parental fear um, so that you can empower your kids to be more independent? And how do you balance caring for and giving fair treatment to, to kids and FOP and siblings? And a lot of these questions really um, sat with me for a while because I've these are quite questions that a lot of parents um, are experiencing and lots of um, uh, areas that you know we're not taught how what the right way is and there is no right way you know we all adapt and we evolve and particularly the types of family structure that we have um, it will vary but I hope that from today's talk there's you know bits of information that you can take away and and start to implement yourself or um, or just to reflect on uh, when when you're factoring in these these topics so the way we've structured today's discussion is to talk about the critical stages of child development and it's very it's not um sort of i'm not going to spend too much time in in all the stages of child development i think what's important for advocacy being that the topic today is supporting um uh, advocacy skills and really supporting your child to be independent in that instance so we're going to focus on the social skills and social um, development we're also going to look at within that methods that you can then take away and, and implement and um and resilience and what does that look like and what does that mean and as we go through these as karen mentioned um we'll pause after the case study and it'll be good to get some questions as well if there's anything specific that you want to cover off so what is the critical stage of child development um, there's, when we look at child development, we know that cognitive, social, and there's emotional factors. But when we look at it from a social development perspective and how that then impacts um, our ability um, to help our child become self-advocates, because if you define what advocacy is, advocacy essentially is providing or supporting an individual to be enable them to um, as, um, you know, uh, be able to speak about what's important for them and, and um, essentially stand up for what's what's right for them and, and the needs and support they need. Um, and a lot of people shy away from that. And so how do we support our children to be advocates in that instance? And we've split it into, or I've split it into three, um, three themes when we look at social development. And so when we're working with, when I'm working with children, I'm working with families, I look at it from an individual perspective um, so themselves as an individual, what's going on for them, an environment environment perspective. So what is around them that can support them and can, can enable them to um, build up some of those skills. And then importantly, that transitional phase. And that's where you move into stepping back and allowing or enabling um, uh, your, your child to start to take some more of that responsibilities. And I know it's quite scary and it's quite worrying along the way, but it's it's doing it in parallel and doing it uh, with one another because then it becomes more of a um, a goal a goal orientated approach than something that you feel you need to you know forcefully do it it shouldn't be like that it should be um, something that you, you can do together. Where I've highlighted those um, uh, areas is where we're going to go into more details with case studies. So from an individual perspective, I want to take you through um, how do you support your child to self regulate their emotions. And that goes back to when we talk about how when children suppress themselves and when they're feeling anxious or worried, how do you get them to self-regulate? Um, from an environmental perspective, we're going to go through the importance of play and embed in building that into your day-to-day. -day. And from a transitional perspective, we're going to look at that child patient, that child-parent relationship, but importantly, independence and resilience and how that can be incorporated within, within, um, within your day-to-day -day as well. So 
this was quite a, a interesting um, model that I wanted to bring to, to your um, focus. Um, because when we look at social development, we, we, we break it into two points. We break it into socialization and personality. And socialization essentially is supporting your child um, to acquire standard values and knowledge of their society. So um, that's when, when people talk about the social rules or talk about social um, experiences. And sometimes, particularly with children who are living with a chronic condition or, or families who are living, um, uh, supporting their child, they, they feel like their family isn't normal when essentially it is. It's just because society has portrayed that there needs to be a certain way that we are and so it's when we look at socialization it's support enabling and supporting your child to learn your values you know your standards and and you know build, building those because that's what's important it's not what society tells us it's essentially what's right for you and your family when we look at personality this is when children start to develop their own unique patterns and feelings and thinking and their behavior and this is all shaped by the different interactions they have with their family, with their siblings, with their friends, with their community. And so when we start to unpick these experiences and, you know, when a child becomes a teenager or becomes a young adult and their personality is where you start to see their unique personality and you wonder, oh, I just, you know, where did that come from? But, you, you know, it's built over time. So as they're quite young, they you know, look at look at their environment and they look at what interactions other people are having and then they start to build their personality. And so that's why when we look at social development, you know, our environment really shapes our sort of personality and our personality can be shaped by the interactions. And so all of these, both of these together go, go quite nicely into advocacy. And so that's when, you know, you can uh, sort of start to measure how somebody will be or when, when they become um, more advocates for, for their self and for others around them. So we're going to start off with case study one. Um, so if you just bear that in mind, the grounding, we'll go straight into the case studies. Um, these are not real children. Um, these are just um, uh, uh, case studies of um, information that I've experienced when talking to children with FOP. Um, been quite fortunate to be able to do research in the area but also when talking to some of the families as well and so I've segmented it into different age groups so now we're meeting Tom who is 10 years old um, so if you think about it from an adolescence perspective so Tom is 10 he finds it difficult to express himself to his family and his healthcare team when asked how he feels he often closes down and is unable to find the words to tell others Tom constantly feels on edge he worries he has no control over his FOP and when it will strike again. When in pain, he will keep it to himself so his parents don't worry. Tom often feels alone. His family are supportive, but they are concerned Tom is not coping. Tom feels that his life is falling apart at the seams. Night terms have become his enemy as these worries keep him up. And I mean, going through this, you know, it's quite powerful because it really starts to relate to, you know, um, how children suppress and keep in loss their emotions because one they don't want to worry their family but also they don't know how to manage them in a healthy way because you know none of us are taught how to self-regulate at school I mean it's becoming more of a thing now but you know it's not a a thing that's regularly taught in the curriculum so why should we learn how to self-regulate or why should we support our children to to learn that um, because self-regulation teaches our children how to control their emotions, thoughts and actions and, and also to, um, I think, uh, to sort of figure out why things happen. Um, there are different emotions that people, children face, uh, feel, pride, shame, embarrassment, feeling conscientious, anxi anxiety, anger, joy and lots of other emotions. Um, and sometimes, as mentioned, these are not managed in a healthy way because one thing I say to um, a lot of people that I speak to is you can't be emotionless because that's we're human, right? So we have to feel some emotion um, and that emotion doesn't necessarily have to be happy because happy is also an emotion. You know, you can have days that you're sad or you can have days that you're concerned, um, but it's in short, it's, it's where it changes is when those emotions become negative emotions and not uh, and, and chronic. So they continue Um when we, if they're short lived, absolutely, they're fine. You know, let, let people have those emotions expressed, 
process, reflect and, and move forward. Um, so regulation is self-regulation is helping children to interpret that emotional feeling and to manage their emotions and uh, at times not mask but those emotions so it's enabling children to learn those techniques to process it reflect maybe talk about it um, but actually then move on and, and get on with their day um, self-regulation also helps children and teenagers to become independent and that's where we, when if it filters in quite nicely with advocacy and independence. Um, why is it important? Again, it's once children have the ability to control their emotions, they can deal with disappointment. They can deal with frustration, injured feelings. Um, they can also deal with um, the different social behaviours um, that they're surrounded. So from their friends or um, other people who um, might not be so, so nice um, uh, as to how they've experienced life at home. Children who are also able to moderate their personal distress are more likely to be empathetic towards others and are able to verbalise their feelings. And this just goes into the fact that, you know, once you learn those skills or once you enable your child to be expressive when it comes to their emotions and they self-regulate, they can then empathize, empathize, be empathetic towards others who are going through something different. But they can also support them to learn self-regulation. So how do you do that? Um, there isn't a, a set way to self-regulate. There are different techniques and tips that are offered. Um, and essentially, it's about modelling. And these modelling techniques start at home and also can start with your family, friends, etc. It's, it's about, you know, when children view other people, how they deal with their emotions, they, they think that's the right way. And so they will take that on board and, and start to do it. You know, children, teenagers, they're still sponges, they're still learning. Um, and so children learn how to control and express themselves by modelling how other people do it. Um, and so some things that you can intervene and support your child is um, when they are, if they are really excited or really upset, helping them to learn how to calm down to a point where they can, t you know, take a breath, step, uh, move away, maybe count to five and start to really reflect on what that feeling is doing for them. Focusing on a task is important because it really helps to um, uh, you know, reduce that anxiety and it gives them a focus to, to look at. Um, uh, you know, having conversations around getting on with other people, getting along with others, and what that means for them. You know, how do they how do they interpret what being a friend is? Um, helping your child understand the emotions, and this is done really well with feeling cards or emotion cards that you know you can you can use so you can show children different images of emojis of different faces and you can get them to express that and ask them you know when have you felt angry or when have you felt sad and you know it's okay so it's really normalizing those feelings in a healthy way um you know building and calming down strategies for self-soothing you know they say when you're a baby babies learn to suck their fun because they're self-soothing and that's their way of, of producing their anxiety and concern um and you know you see that some children as they grow up they've got their favorite blanket or their teddy bear or people bite their you know some people bite their nails these are all self-soothing techniques so let's find let's enable or, for, or support children learn healthy self-soothing techniques and and what that could be um uh, to self-regulate um, problem solving and negotiation skills are, are really key um, because that reduces again anxiety and concern but also gives um, children control and it helps them be in control of that scenario um, and importantly modeling self-regulation as a parent so you also doing that at home and um, and, and normalizing that you know when you're maybe when you're frustrated or when you're um, uh, you know feeling sad um, saying it I feel sad today and, and this is why and this is why how it's making me feel so really normalizing those conversations important point to remember about self-regulation is that self-regulation helps children become more independent because it allows them uh, it gives them that ability to make appropriate decisions and behave and also their behaviors and they learn how to behave in new situations with less guidance from you because if they can do all of that um, or they're doing bits of that, then they're feeling more confident to make decisions. They're feeling more able to manage that anxiety, that concern they might have. And they start to um, feel more in control of that situation. So I'm going to stop there before we go into the next case study, just to see if there's any questions about self-regulation. We, we did have one question, Samira, that was typed in. And... Um, 
it was about, you know, we, we have good days, we have bad days, but how do you know when there is a tipping point, or how do you know what the tipping point is to where your child might be really struggling with self-regulation? So I, I know it's typical for all of us to have good days and bad days, but what are some signs maybe that parents can look for to know that their child is kind of at a tipping point where they're really struggling with self-regulation? So um, what's interesting is that dependent on the age as well, because younger children will probably express it differently, whether it's older children or teenagers might express it differently. And then you start to wonder whether it's hormonal or whether it's actually, you know, it's getting to a point where they're finding it really difficult. Um, if, if you're starting to use some of these self-regulation techniques quite early on, children, it becomes quite normal for the child. So they start to normalize it. So more expressive in their in their speech, they talk more about their emotions, it becomes more of a conversation, um, which isn't sort of um, restricted. So if they feel able to have those conversations, but let's say we start to introduce self-regulation at an old teenage adolescence um, stage, you can, each child is unique. And so some of the typical signs that children are not coping is, is definitely on their behavior, so how they behave, um, if they're more withdrawn, if they are getting more anxious about things that they didn't, they didn't get anxious about before, um, if they're um, not being able to um, articulate or put into words um, what's going on and, you know, that it's affecting their sleep on, uh, or, you know, um, they prefer to be more left alone and, and not really interact in social situations where they probably would have done before. Um, there, there, those are some of the signs that you probably need to would go. You probably need to spend a bit one to one time with that child to just um, do something that's not directed to saying how do you feel because you'll get a response saying I feel fine or oh, oh, I don't want to talk about it. But actually doing it in a way that's more of a playful thing or more of a you know let's let's spend the day together and, and then start to um, tell your, your own story to the child because when you start to be, when you start to be expressive and say you know what I've had a really bad day at work and you know this person really got on my nerves today and that starts the conversation it becomes quite normalized so it's it's it, the, the go the key word here is normalization it's just making it more of your everyday language and everyday speech around um, talking about your emotions and having those discussions. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Does anyone want to ask a question live? Um, if you didn't hear at the beginning, there is down at the bottom, you can raise your hand. So if you do have a question about this particular um, case study or theme of self-regulation, just click that and I can turn on your video and audio. But if we don't have any more questions for this one, then we can maybe move on to the second case study and topic. And then again, we can always circle back if you have a question that pops up from something previous. Um, thanks, Karen. Um, so we're going to move on to case study two, um, which is Seoul. Um, so Seoul is, this case study is for younger children. So Seoul is four years old. He was diagnosed with FRP when he was three. Um, for for Seoul, his FRP is affecting his shoulders, and at times he feels significant pain, especially during the day. He's not as mobile as his peers, and often leads to him feeling frustrated through his play and not fully able to understand why he's not a, he's not able to join in his activities at school and nursery and just really be part of that peer group. Um, for him, there's parental concerns. So from a parent's perspective, um, there's fears around making the wrong decision for him. Um, finding the right balance of allowing Seoul to live in a, a, a you know a normal childhood, um, balancing taking care of Seoul and his siblings, feeling guilty that spending more time with him and not the siblings. Um, and for Seoul, his worries are quite simplistic, which are you know why can't I why can I not play with my friends? And so what I wanted to capture in this case study was particularly younger children. You know we as as parents have more worries and concerns and fears because our child is quite young isn't able to verbalize as much as maybe an older child um, but children are so less complicated and for them they their worries are quite simplistic which is you know I just want to play or I just want to be part of what that other person's doing um, and so they don't understand when they're asked when they're when they're to suggest that maybe don't join in or you know, it's not good for your uh, you know for you or your condition so 
how do we find that balance and how do we produce, how do we support you to reduce your worries and concerns and and you know have that environment which is safe but also um, allow soul to explore um, so this topic is focusing on the environment and how what the the role of playing and learning through play and Learning for play is, you know, I think as adults, we can still learn for play. Um, but when you're a young child and maybe you're not at school as often and you're spending more time at home, um, what else could be done to support that and also support your development, support their development? Um, so re research has suggested that children with chronic conditions cope surprisingly well um, and they are really keen to play and explore. And in a child's world, um, and remember, a four-year-old's world, um, fear, pain, embarrassment, confusion um, can be ordered and controlled through or can be sort of managed um, through songs, jokes, art and funny stories because like, I, like I've mentioned before, for a younger child, the, the way emotions are expressed are, diff are different, it's a different threshold to when you're an adolescent or when, when you're a teenager or when you're a young adult. Um, for younger children, if they feel like they're embarrassed or if they're confused, these can these interventions are can be done through play. So, um, you know, creating a narrative, a funny story, or or working, you know, creating a joke or doing art or creative stuff um, can really help them channel that frustration. Um, and children develop through play, and it doesn't mean that they have to be physical play or they have to be running around. You know, it can be a sit down task. It can be an activity. Essentially, at this age, it's about attachment and engagement and, you know, that child feeling like they have that environment where they're able to express themselves, but also not feel that they, um, so they don't feel let confused. Um, and so play provides children with a sense of control and empowerment. And, you know, it gives them, they're able to dictate, they're able to sort of take the lead, they're able to feel empowered. They can get their, you know, your your fam family around them to really support them within that. Um, parents and children can develop um, gaps and playful routines. Um, and what's some some research has show, has shown that particularly younger children, where they find medical experiences quite unpleasant, um, you know, there's different techniques that you can turn that appointment or that doctor's session into more of a playful role play or a routine, so it becomes quite normalised. And so, for instance, you can say you're going to um, an adventure and you're going to see, um, you know, the pirates and he's going to provoke, you know, give, you know, check you. And so there's lots of things that you can turn this into. Um, and there's lots of lovely research out there as well that talks about fantasy play and medical treatments and creating that experience where it's less frightening for a child and it's given them a sense of control. Um, and so, you know, do, do feel free to look at the research out there because I think there's really good examples that you can start to play in or invite into your home as well. Um, but playing can be a family experience. And this is where we talk about siblings because it's about in, engaging and, and um, getting siblings involved as well. Um, I know there's a bit of work that needs, you know, sometimes siblings don't understand um, you know, how they can play with, with, the, with the child that's suffering from FIP in a um, safe way so they might feel reluctant. So, um, you know, it's you know, giving that time and space for siblings to understand you know, what, what, what can be done, what can't be done, and, and almost you know, find, finding that middle ground. So really helping them understand the importance of spending time with their brother or sister and providing them with that responsibility. Um, and so they also feel like they are empowered and responsible to, to have that time um, with, with, that, with the child to you know, express, play and develop. And so if you go back to if we go back to Sol and we talk, we think about you know, his, his frustration is he just wants to play. Um, and so that's, I guess, the message here is that it doesn't necessarily have to be a physical play environment. It can also be translated in home through, through role play, through, through fantasy play, through um, a creative um, aspects, which, which you can also build in some um, uh, experiences around um, some of their medical experiences to start to make that more of a fun and enjoyable session as well. I want to touch on parental guilt because that comes into Soul's case study as well, and this is quite a, quite a, um, I guess, 
quite an intense topic because you know we all feel guilt in different ways and so there isn't a a set way of why people feel guilty but I've tried to capsulate it into a few lines and um and you know it, it's important that you know, if there if that guilt becomes quite chronic is to you know address it in, in a through, through therapy or through um support but parental guilt um and happens to all of us but when it comes to when you're live when you're looking after a child um uh and you know you've got you've got other children but also when you're looking after a child the guilt could be around you know um what can i do more or what what am i not doing uh what how can i um help my child and all of this filters into that constant narrative which is not doing anything but triggering your guilt even more um so guilt is considered an unhealthy negative emotion um, because it triggers people to think about what they have done wrong. And I want you to remember that it's it's the action that we start to play on. Um, for some, the guilt can turn into other emotions such as depression and anxiety, um, particularly when we start to really reflect on that situation beyond our control. So we sit there and we ruminate and we think and we think and all we're doing is just, just pondering in our mind and we start to build, we start to catastrophize and it becomes a bigger thing than it started off with. Um, in rational therapy, um, it's, guilt is defined as you know, guilt comes from not from your actions, but from the beliefs you have about those actions. And if anything, if you take anything away today, take that away because it is, it's not what you're doing or what you're not doing. It's, it's about the beliefs that you have about that. And rational therapy talks very much about emotional responsibility um, and it's not that I'm, I'm saying that you're intentionally doing that it's not intentional it's just we naturally do that because when we talk about the narrative that goes in our mind though that narrative is our beliefs and those are the words that keep playing and I always talk about it as a broken record because it just keeps playing and playing and it the consequence of that is we start to feel guilty and and we get, start to get low um, so how do we change our beliefs to so they're more preference, more flexible and not rigid. Um, and also, um, you know, when we're self-drowning, um, uh, particularly within um, that heart, that guilt, it also, as I mentioned, causes depression. Um, and so how do we where, where, how do we sort of intervene so it doesn't become more of an unhealthy negative emotion as well as other unhealthy negative emotions? Um, but, you know, one thing to remember, one thing I would say is that, you know, we all... F- as as parents feel guilt and we probably will feel that throughout our child's life um but you know it's um if intervening when you're when you when you're sitting there at night and you're reflecting and you start that starts to play in your mind stop and think you know what is this doing for me is this is this helping me in any way is this making my relationship better with my child or is this affecting my relationship with my other you know sibling other family members um what is the benefit of me feeling like this so it's about questioning ourselves and our preference beliefs um and when we when we learn to start to manage our unhealthy emotions it doesn't have to be guilt it can be other unhealthy emotions um some of the key things i always say is you know reflection um understanding your narrative so when you're sitting there writing it down saying what am i actually saying to myself here why am i feeling like this um uh disputing that narrative um and so like i said asking yourself is this is this doing anything for me is this is this making is this a, you know is this improving my mental health is it impacting my mental health um and and then looking at preference so looking at alternative flexible beliefs which help you then effectively manage that scenario in a more healthier way and i'm sure some of you have already seen this diagram um when you look at cbt so um essentially it's that cycle of our emotions um trigger our so our thoughts trigger our emotions which trigger our behavior and so that thought is our narrative and how do we stop at that point before we go into that emotions and that behavior i'm going to stop there before we move on to the next case study to see if there's any questions there Let me check the Q&A. We don't have any submitted in Q&A, but we did have one submitted in the chat. 
um, which was just how can parents help support older siblings who may be more aware of the long-term progression of FOP while the younger child may be unaware. So is it better to hold that conversation in private or is it good to have a younger child present um, as a part of that discussion? Is that, uh, so, sorry, just to, is that the younger child with FOP or the older child? Yeah, if a younger child with FOP who has an older sibling who may be aware of the progression of SOP, but ah. the younger sibling does not know the progression of the disease himself. Mm -hmm. It's a really good question, and I was I, I was asked that question once before. Um, and so, one thing I've I've always said about in, um, advocacy and independence, and really building on those skills, is um, you know finding the balance of involving the child into conversations when it comes to the healthcare team, but also helping them understand it from your perspective. So, um, children don't understand particularly younger children, medical terms. I mean, we as adults don't understand. And so the, and also the reality of things are not um, visualized like we are as adults. So if you say, to, if, if you say progression, the child won't know for them, tomorrow is their, you know, for them, all they care about is the next day or, or the day after or certain events as such as their birthday. So they're not thinking about long-term progression. And so if you're wanting to tell the siblings who are older, um, I think that it's probably um, more healthier to tell them separately, just so they can really ask questions, giving them that space um, independently, because you know, they might have questions that they might they might feel uneasy to ask in front of the child, younger, the younger sibling as well. So first giving them that space to just really just hash it out, really explore. Um, uh, really have that discussion and, and then also they, they, they probably want to know how they can support so you know, having that conversation is important. Um, when it comes to the younger child it's also helping them to understand that their siblings are there to support so the siblings themselves can go to the younger child and say look I'm here for you and I, I you know I understand that you know things are um, it might not be so easy there'll be things that there'll be days that you'll feel um, frustrated there'll be days that you you know you want to just relax and I, I can do that with you I can relax so it's just giving it's giving the older child that independence to um, feel confident to have that relationship with that child with their brother with their sister there shouldn't be a middle person in the way they have their own relationship and that sort of builds on that environment and that nurturing and that aspect of you know not making it awkward really feeling like a family um, and going back slightly to the younger children when they are going to doctor's appointments and pairing you might feel oh do you know if I if they're in the room are they going to feel really affected by what they're hearing what I've said before is that what a really good way of of managing that is once the doctor says whatever they need to say then in asking the child in front of the doctor saying to them did you understand what he said or she said do you have any questions it really empowering them they might not have any questions they might just say something like uh, you know when am i when am i not seeing you next <laughs> but you know just giving them that independence to feel that they're part of that conversation and that that's what builds into that self-regulation that independence that resilience is is giving that child giving that person giving that person a voice um and and you know and i think integrating is so important um so hopefully that answers your question yeah, that answered it very well. And I, I love your examples too, because like you said, it, it does give even a very young child the opportunity to start building some advocacy skills, which I think sometimes as adults, we don't think that younger children are capable of that, but they, they definitely yeah. are capable to start working on it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Younger children nowadays are very advanced <laughs> in their questioning and they're quite funny actually as well. Um, so. I'll move on to case study three then, and then we can always go back if there's more questions. Um, so case study three is about um, Sarah, who's 17. So she's a lot older. This is that older age. Um, so Sarah is 17 years old. She's planning to attend college after the summer break and is really excited but nervous. Unfortunately for Sarah, she's currently experiencing an active stage of her FOP, particularly because hormone, hormone change and, you know, uh, triggered. Um, She's struggling, therefore she's struggling with both decreased mobility and, and also pain management. Sarah has less energy throughout the day, which is also impacting her quality of life. 
Um, Sarah's family are supportive, but her dad can sometimes be overwhelming, overwhelmingly helpful, and he often worries about her. She wants to be independent and feels like she's able to think ahead, but doesn't know how to, and uh, and want and and isn't sure so sure about the consequences and what the consequences might be if she then becomes independent. And I think this fits quite nicely with that transitional piece. Is you know. Um, when your child is at a certain age and they naturally rebel anyway, um, and see they're also um, living with a with a chronic condition or living with a condition, then you you feel you feel extra worried or you want to protect them even more so because you know the world is um, not so nice out there. And so, how do you um, feel like? How do you sort of be a, how how are you able to just slightly step? step back and really enable them to make those um uh, to learn and, and to learn through the, their experiences because that's the only way you can build somebody's resilience is when they when they're in situations and they're able to process them in a healthy way um, so that's where resilience and independence comes in to this theme and I, I kept this slide quite quite blank because the, the reason why is because I wanted to go through resilience um, and what that definition is. And um, if you look at it, oh, God, I've skipped. If you, if you look at the definition of resilience, it's the capacity to quickly um, or capacity to recover quickly from difficult toughness. Um, if you look at the um, definition of independence, it's about accepting and believing that you and you alone must be responsible for your life. Now, that is quite intense, and those definitions are quite strong. Um, so you don't necessarily take it based on those definitions, but you take it based on the premise of what resilience and independence is suggesting. Um, because when we're resilient, we adapt, we, we recover, we um, learn those soft skills or learn those skills to um, be able to um, manage that situation um, without it overwhelming and overburdening us. Now, for Sarah, in order for her to you know, get out there and go to college, um, you know, there is an element of her needing to learn how to be resilient and how, how to be able to you know, um, bounce back in scenarios. Um, and also not forgetting that she's now going to become independent enough to make decisions for herself where she might not involve her family. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think that it's important that, you know, um, children when they're becoming adults they have that they have that time to really um uh, learn and develop as well um now if we go back into the different things that i've just spoken about where we talk about self-regulation where we talk about um uh, sort of learning through play all of these over the years build up um to really provide your child with a toolkit of techniques um, so when they get to this stage they're able to then um, uh, sort of become more resilient and they're able to start to become more independent in their approach and in their way and in, in their in their speech and, and and be able to vocalize when they need more support and when they don't you know they are going to come back to their families for, for help and advice but it will be done differently than it was before so it's that Told that, that that transition that you've probably heard you probably hear lots of stories about you know that transition of a, of 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 a, of a child um, and parents stepping back and trying to step back um, and it's just finding that balance and I think that there's work to be done in both in both groups both the parent feeling um, uh, you know feeling confident and, and able uh, to to just you know, allow their child to maybe step away and 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 learn and experience and be exposed to to scenarios, um, but also the child having those soft skills or those skills to be able to manage those in, in an effective way, um, uh, which which is only going to really support them because we learn through experiences. Um, I see there's a few questions um, on there, so I don't know if we want to stop for some questions now. Sorry, I was muted. Um, yeah, a question did come in um, that says, what if you who has FOP are aware of your needs, like going out and um, being out and about, but your family isn't? If they're in a mindset that they're protecting you from everything, but that they're then hurting you um, more than protecting you at this point. So 
how would um, maybe a young adult handle a situation like that if you have any suggestions? Yeah, that's a really that's a really good question. Um, thank you for that. Um, and so from what I'm, what I'm understanding, it's about being able to vocalise to your family that you're wanting to be more independent, um, but um, also, you know, it, I guess also the family feeling like you're able to cope in those scenarios and not and not um, by not allowing you to be independent, it's actually impacting you more from a from your mental health perspective. I guess that's my interpretation from that question. I hope that's the right interpretation. Um, and so I think that you know when we talk about what we talked about before around um, you know having those open conversations um, through you know I know for younger children I talked about feeling cards, but um, it's that normalization where you can um, be more vocal and and say um, you know this is this is how I'm feeling and, and I know that it's easy for me to say and probably difficult to implement but I'm not saying that it's a thing that happens you know in one night it's a process so it's enabling yourself to feel to build up those skills where you're feeling confident enough to um you know have that conversation maybe started by writing it down and when you write it down it comes up it, it reflects or deflects out of you so it's on paper and becomes more real um you can start to see you know you can start to see how you would approach that scenario um essentially it's not that the family is intentionally trying to hurt or, or, or affect or hurt you or, or or that scenario because for them it goes back to that parental guilt and that you know wanting to bubble wrap wanting to protect um and so their mindset is is that you know how do i make life easy or life safe for my child um, and so it's about changing that mindset and that's where when we talk about having these conversations you know being able to be um, uh, work, work on those skills of resilience of um, uh, you know uh, regulation of um, expression um, then you could essentially um, have that open discussion and, and figure out a middle ground and figure out what works for both both of you um so you can then at least have have sought to have some independence um and and uh, hopefully that will start to show your family as well that actually it's okay to to let go and i think it is around you know parental anxiety and it is around parental concern and i think that if you um essentially that that's sort of where i think it sits when it comes to that that conflict um within that i hope that answers your question yeah actually i I liked what you just said about maybe, um, you know, providing small opportunities to slowly build up little moments of independence, um, because the next question that came through said, um, what if you are aware of good behaviors, but the family isn't, and no amount of talking or shouting is really getting through to your parents. So your suggestions of writing things down and trying to open conversations, um, what would kind of be your recommendations if you have any on mm -hmm. how to start getting a teenager to convince parents to maybe provide them small opportunities of independence to show them that things will be okay and help reduce that parental guilt do you have any suggestions when when kids aren't able to get through to parents do you know what that's a really good that, that's a really good point because if you think about it now if you look at the barriers, what are the barriers here? The barriers to me sounds like it's communication barriers, and um, and not only communication, but there's there's um, a there's there's a sort of a, a blocker to why the parents are feeling like um, you know they can't step away and enable that uh, that, that child or that, that adolescent teenager to um, you know go out there and do whatever they need to do um, so I think there needs to be a compromise and I think that compromise comes from both sides because I think that you know you can have conflict and you can you know argue and disagree and all it's doing is just you know affecting the environment affecting the atmosphere and so it's it's really about you know when we talk about um, children and adolescents getting more responsibility is also getting them to um, have a conversation as you would if you put yourself if you are at work or if you are at college or school, how would you approach your teacher about a task? So if you go with that mindset, um, then you're more able to articulate what you need and, more, and you're more able to um, 
constructively argue your your point um when it comes to our families we do get over emotional with our responses and so that's when it turns into more of a disagreement um so i always say step step out of this, the box for a bit um, how would you talk how would you give advice to a friend if they needed to approach their parents about something um what advice would you give to them can you not give yourself that advice um and try that out and um and if it is that and nothing that you're you're doing is getting through to your parents then it is about sitting down and maybe just saying to your mom parents that you know what are you worried about what are your three main worries that which is why you're not let, you know um being able to compromise in that um and really just um working through those because it might be some quite simplistic things um that you can figure out but because of that c- continuous conflict you're not able to have that um conversation so the friend scenario role model works really well and i've always said to people step when you're not in the situation yourself you're able to rationalize that effective more effectively um so step out um think about what advice you'd give to a friend and take that advice yourself as well when when um trying to approach your family perfect thank you um, let me just check one last time. It doesn't look like we have any more submitted in the Q&A or the chat. And if anyone has any questions that has come up from any part of the presentation today, um, if you'd like to answer or ask them live, I'm happy to do that. You can also just raise your hand um, down at the bottom. Um, but if we don't have any more questions, we'll just give everyone just a minute or two to think about it. But um, this has really been an intriguing topic, and I know it's a lot to cover. We have a lot of different ages to cover, you know, from young childhood to, to teenage to young adult. Um, there's a lot of information there, and I know we kind of just brushed the surface, um, but this has been very, very informative. I really appreciate you presenting on this, Samira. No, absolutely. It's been my pleasure. And, and just to say, as Karen said, that you know, these are topics that you could really go into in more depth. Um, but if anything, if the key takeaways from from hair is that, um, you know, particularly for the younger children, it's about the environment and what they're learning from that environment. So really, you know, exploring, playing, really developing those skills so they are becoming more independent and empower, empowering them to have a voice, getting them involved in, in things, um, asking their viewpoints on uh, after do- doctor's appointments. And, and even if it's something simplistic um, for for the self-regulation that works across all ages so really starting to build that on modeling that at home getting children to be more expressive with their emotions having those open conversations about how they're feeling and so they're not suppressing and keeping it within themselves and for the older child and the adolescents it's about you know um, uh, resilience and independence and giving them those key skills to learn learn through their um uh, you know, things that happen, you know, and, and how they bounce back and, and giving them, you know, allowing them to have that space because otherwise we're not going to, we, we never learn if we don't experience it ourselves. Um, that's when we build up core skills to then manage it more effectively in the future. So I hope those, I hope it helped and supported you. And, and uh, you know, there is lots of research out there which you can really look into as well if you want to um, focus more on that as well. But thank you so much. Yeah, so I don't see any more questions. So um, just thank you to all of you who did attend live. And like I said, this will be uploaded to YouTube so that if you want to go back to listen to um, any part of it over again, um, that will be posted on our YouTube channel for you to go back and view. So thank you all for attending and thank you, Samira, for presenting for us today. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you.